Welcome to the Rediscovery channel. This is the channel where every week I and uh, my good friend Stilgar, we come up with a topic from history that the other person either hasn't heard about or at the very least doesn't know what we're going to talk about. So my name is Ivor Kovac and today is my turn. And um, today what I'm actually going to do is uh, respond to a request. And this request comes from my wife. So I'm going to ask uh, Stilgar, <clears throat> how much do you know about uh, the English, like how they took over India? Very little. Yeah, I didn't know very much either um, about how they did it. So, and neither did my wife. And uh, she asked me to find out how they did it. Because if you look at uh, the world today, you know, England is a very small country. Even if you count like the whole of the UK, it's still pretty small and India is pretty big and it's got a lot more resources and a lot more people. So how would England take over such a huge, by comparison, country with more resources, more people and more territory? Doesn't hmm. seem, you know, like if they had to do it today, uh, it wouldn't be that wouldn't be so easy. Um, of course, in fact, back then, India didn't really exist in the form that it does today. So it was more the English taking over a region. So it's actually kind of interesting how they did it. And it took me a long time. I ended up doing a lot of reading for this topic. And I still don't uh, even know everything that there is to know because it was done over a great period of time and uh, not all at once and not all deliberately. So what I want to do, though, is <clears throat> before we get into that, I want to lay down some background stuff. So um, at the time that the English came, started coming to India, the, uh, the Mughals were actually in charge of most of the country. And of course, the, the area that they ruled didn't directly correspond to the geographic boundaries of what we would call India today. So you had uh, the Mughals. They ruled from 1527 to 1857. Um, and the Mughals is a Muslim dynasty. And the name Mughal is actually like a corrupted version of uh, Mongol because these people were descended from a mixture of Turks and Mongols who had converted to Islam. And their dynasty was started by a guy named Babur. And Babur supposedly is de descended from uh, Tamerlane, you know, in, in, we call him Tamerlane, but <clears throat> his name is actually uh, Timur the Lame, and Genghis Khan. So he has kind of a lofty ancestry, this dude. Um, and of course, when Muslims took over, they formed a permanent ruling class, and they did the sort of things that uh, they usually do when they took over, forced conversion, Jizya attacks, and one of the things they would do is uh, when they're fighting with the Indian forces, the prisoners of war that they would take, they would uh, make conversion of Islam as a requirement in order to be let go. So that was their kind of standard procedure. And they did not speak any Indian languages. They spoke uh, Persian as the official court language. And then in conversational speech, um, they would use uh, Urdu, which is still spoken in Pakistan today. And I believe that Urdu is actually a um, <clears throat> modified version of Hindi, but I'm not completely sure. Um, so there's that. And they, um, they did let up after a while, like uh, as they got more wealthy, they started to chill out somewhat and allow for more religious freedom. And then eventually they took away the Jizya tax. But then there was a guy who came uh, called Aurangzeb. And later on, I'm probably gonna do a video that talks about him more, but <clears throat> Aurangzeb, he went uh, full totalitarian and he ruled from 1658 to 1707. And uh, he, he re-implemented like the Jizya tax and forced conversion and he also decided to ban uh dancing throughout the entire mughal realm and if you know anything about uh if anybody who's familiar with india you know that like dancing is a big part of their culture 
Um, you see it in the movies. Like just about every movie is interrupted with a dance scene. They do it at weddings, parties, special events. And like uh, the Hindu religion, they have dancing rituals as part of their worship services. So by banning a dance, this guy is interfering with their proper uh, exercise of their religion. They can't fulfill properly. So Aurangzeb, he really irritates um, the native Indian population, really offends them. So their loyalty to the Mughals is meager at best. And so the date, and I'll put all these in the slideshow, like the date for the Mughals, 1527 to 1857. And Aurangzeb, 1658 to 1707. And Aurangzeb is kind of the beginning of the end for the Mughals. Um, and then while Aurangzeb is there, there's the um, there's this group of people called uh, Maratha, and that's when the Maratha Empire gets started. And they rebel against the Muslims and decide they want to take back their country, basically. Um, so the Maratha Empire runs from 1674 to 1818. And it starts in a place which uh, today is called Maharashtra. It's a state that's in the west and middle of India today. And actually, um, one way you can remember Maharashtra is that's where Mumbai is and also Bollywood. Although Bollywood um, is a Hindi, uh, they use the Hindi language for all their movies. But the uh, Maratha people, they speak a different language. It's called Marathi. So the Maratha Empire, uh, as the they're growing as the Mughals are shrinking, basically. So that's that's the background information. Um, <clears throat> so the English, uh, they first so they're interested in um, they're interested in the spice trade, and they first start coming to India in the 1600s. And the Indian spice trade was dominated mainly by Spain and Portugal up until the defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588. And what happened is uh, a bunch of English merchants, they wanted to have the monopoly on all of the trade with India. So they petitioned Queen Elizabeth I, uh, the first, to give them exclusive trade rights with India. And they formed a corporation called the East India Company. And once that was formed, if you wanted to, if you were a part of the English realm and you wanted to buy anything from India or sell anything to them, you had to go through the East India Company. They were given a full legal monopoly to all trade. And this was a corporation with uh, shareholders and its goal is to generate revenue for the shareholders. And their capital was in London. So they, they had a big, nice building there. And the English are interested in silk, tea, salt, opium, and a whole range of spices, including, uh, and, and what I found out as I was doing this is like uh, black pepper was worth a lot to them. Like they were really interested in that. So the first uh, expedition is sent in 1601, and James Lancaster is the captain. Queen Elizabeth I gives him six letters that she wrote by hand. And these are addressed to different local kings and rulers, but she left the names blank so that uh, James Lancaster could write in the name of whoever he wanted and, you know, give them this personal letter from the queen. And he returns with 500 tons of pepper. So, like, you know, the, the kind of pepper that you put on your food, like from the shaker, that's what they were bringing. And then um, in 1615... They get permission, the, the East India Company, that is, they get permission from uh, Emperor Jahangir to start establishing settlements in India, like uh, offices and locations that are there. And in 1639, uh, and Emperor Jahangir, he's uh, one of the Mughals. And at this time, the Mughals are still controlling most of the area and, and Pakistan, too. So, they're, you know, the geographic area of Pakistan, India and I believe also Bangladesh. Not all of India, some of the southern uh, regions were still free of them. But anyways, I'll, I'll put a map in there, you, you can see. So in uh, 1639, the English, or, or at least the East India Company, 
they established Fort St. George, uh, which is a military base. And today, this structure is still there. And the, uh, the Tamils, they use it as the headquarters for their regional government. I think their state parliament meets there. And then uh, the next thing they do is um, they establish settlements in Bombay, which today is called Mumbai. Like after India gets their independence from the English, they change the name to Mumbai. So there's Bombay, Madras, and Calcutta, which serve as factories and trading posts for them. And one thing that happens is uh, a lot of Indians who live in those areas end up working for them, uh, making textiles. And the English have an interest in cotton. And uh, a lot of Indian merchants from further inland, they come to these outposts where the English are in order to sell them their stuff directly. Uh, so this is done during the second half of the 17th century. Um, and also, this, this is all a totally private endeavor. The English government is not doing this. And uh, while they're there, they need security to protect their assets, right? Especially as they grow. So what they do is they start hiring their own army. And their army is actually made up of mostly Indians who need work and, and commanded mostly by uh, English officers. And at this time, there's not really much in the way of Indian nationalism. Like uh, today, if you go to India, there's a pretty strong like uh, nationalist and patriotic movement. But back then, the idea of being Indian, I don't know if it even existed because uh, most people, they they thought of themselves as like in terms of group identity, they had their religion. On top of that, they had their caste and then they had their ethnicity and language group. So like uh, Muslims didn't see themselves as being the same as Hindus. And then when it comes to Hindus, you have a lot of different ethnic groups like uh, the Maratha people. They don't even speak, uh, you know, all these cultures, they have their own languages. There's over a thousand different languages there. And most of them are not mutually intelligible. So there's like the Marathas. They don't even speak any of the same languages that the Mughals would use. And vice versa. Um, so there's not like a, a whole sense of uh, a strong sense of being Indian and having a particular country that's that's for themselves. So they don't really mind for the most part that this big, huge English corporation is coming in and taking over. And in fact, the East India Co Company, for the most part, they don't interfere with local customs. They allow for freedom of religion. They allow the landowners and local rulers to retain their power and their land. And uh, local rulers are used to gather taxes and provide order. So, you know, even if they were going to oppress somebody, the local people wouldn't blame the East India Company. They would blame like the the local ruler, the magistrates like, oh, this guy raised taxes. They don't know where to, you know, because he's the one that would gather it. Um, so they, they also don't try to impose any religion or ideology at first and, and for a good long time, but later they will, and I'll come to that. So um, they do pressure the rulers that are under their influence to not make war with other rulers. And what this does is it actually creates um, a more peaceful environment for the regular people, the regular citizens who often had no direct interaction with the English at all. Maybe they don't even see an English person, but they just know that, uh, oh, now there's less fighting. Um, OK, so then then they start to kind of uh, impose things like the second half of the 1700s is when the English start to kind of put their foot down a bit more, though they're still going to use kind of an indirect route and weasel tactics to do so. So they start buying up land. And um, one of the ways they'll do it is like uh, they'll tell a local ruler that, you know, hey, we'll never attack you if when you die, you sign your land over to the company in your will. Uh, so they would do that and the company would buy up land in that way. And also um, they would make treaties with different rulers 
and they would say, you know, we don't we don't want to tax you or anything, but um, if you'll just let us have a little bit of land inside of our uh, inside of your territory, then we'll we'll guarantee your safety and we'll send troops, our own troops, there to watch the land. And they would agree to that. Um, and then, but then once they were there, they would appoint a local advisor to work with the ruler. And I believe the local advisor was an Indian person, but it would be somebody that's loyal to the company. So they would be like uh, <clears throat> kind of giving this ruler the ideas and conditions and stuff like that. So most of their staff is actually is actually Indians who are just collaborating with them and most of the army. So it's not like the English army is going through there with their red coats and taking over, or at least not at this stage. Um, okay, so by 1750, they have a humongous, very large private army. And of course, it's mostly Indian soldiers with English officers. And the English uh, government, they don't have to do anything uh, to maintain control in India. They're letting this private corporation do all the work. And it's not paid for by English tax dollars. It's paid for by consumers. Okay. And then the English, they have one of the large, they have actually, I believe at this time, the largest Navy in the world. So they use the Navy to keep out, uh, to deal with foreign competitors who might want to, like other European powers, if they want to come there and do something, the English Navy is ready uh, to stop them. But they don't have to spend any effort occupying or doing anything in India because the company is taking care of all that. So then, um, you know, at this point, there some of the local rulers are starting to get annoyed because they realize what's happening. They're losing, uh, you know, a lot of the country is being taken over, and there's a very good chance that uh, they're going to be next and they're going to be surrounded. And one thing that the East India Company did do is they would interfere in uh, wars of succession like they might like if there's a uh, an issue of succession then they might support the weaker candidate and just give him the little bit of help that he needs on the condition that when he wins he gives uh, special concessions to the east india company and and also wars between different uh, rulers different provinces they would Sometimes pick one guy over the other, probably the guy that's weaker and more in need of help, tip it in his favor in exchange for concessions. So all manner of weasel tactics, basically, is what they're doing. So the, then we have uh, the Battle of Plassey, which happens in 1759. Okay, and this battle is between uh, the, uh, an English commander named Robert Clive and uh, this guy... Siraj Ud Duala, who's the Nawab of Bengal, which corresponds roughly to the, um, the modern state of West Bengal. Um, so the Battle of Plassey was fought at an area called Palashi um, on the banks of this uh, river near this river called the ba Bhagirathi River near Calcutta. And basically um, the Siraj... Siraj, he's angry because uh, the, I mean, he's being, the other territories are all kind of falling under the control of the English. Um, and he's letting them do some business in his area, but they're not paying taxes to him. Like they're not meeting up to all the agreed upon terms. They're also, they're supporting his political enemies. And they built um, a fortification, like they fortified Calcutta. And they established Fort William without asking for his permission. So basically, they're not, uh, they're, they're kind of out of control. They're not doing what he says. So Siraj, uh, he attacks Calcutta and he gets the French to help him because there was also a French East India Company, but it's very small. And uh, what happens is, uh, and I heard this, I don't know if it's true, so take it with a grain of salt, but supposedly um, Siraj Udwala he locks up a hundred East India company officials in like one prison cell that was designed to accommodate 10 people, something, something crazy like that. I don't know if it's true or not, but I mean, it could be, and that, that would just annoyed him, uh, annoyed them even more. So the East India company sends uh, Robert Clive 
to take back Calcutta and deal with the situation. And actually, they're grossly outnumbered by um, Nawab, by the Nawab's forces. So, and and also, you know, the the Nawab is being helped by the French. So, um, <clears throat> what what Clive does is he reaches out to this guy named Mir Jafar, who is the I believe the supreme commander of the Nawab's army, and he cuts a deal with him and says, you know, that if you will stay out of the battle, keep your forces out of the battle, then I'll make you the next uh, Nawab. And he agrees to it. So uh, Siraj Udwala, he has 50,000 soldiers, 40 cannons, and 10 war elephants. And Clive has just 3,000 soldiers. But um, he ends up winning the battle for a few reasons. One is that uh, it rains and... uh, the Bengals, they don't bother to cover their ammunition and their weapons, so the stuff gets waterlogged, and there's like a delay in firing. Also, um, the Nawab's forces were still using matchlock rifles, and I believe the the English had something better, but I'm not sure. I'll have to. I'll check and I'll drop it in the uh, slideshow. Mm-hmm. Um, but but they and then of course uh, Mir Jafar. He holds his forces back while the fighting is going on. So uh, Siraj, he loses the battle and he ends up running for his life. But later on, he's caught. He's killed by some of his own people. And then uh, Mir Jafar, he becomes the next Nawab of Bengal. But of course, now he's a puppet ruler for the East India Company. And the French are driven out completely. And uh, Mir Jafar, he doesn't like being a puppet ruler. So he actually appeals to the Dutch East India Company and uh, gets them to try to help him push out the English. But the East India Company beats them again, and also the Dutch. And they replace him with another puppet ruler. And then later on, uh, I think in uh, 1765, Clive is made, uh, Robert Clive, he's made the official ruler of West Bengal. Um, and then the the Mughals are still around at this time, but they're basically just ceremonial puppet rulers with no real power. But they get the they get the Mughal emperor to officially uh, nominate him as the the ruler for that place. And so by the 1760s, um, they had the East India Company has no serious foreign rivals in India. Um, okay, but. The as I mentioned earlier, the Maratha Empire, which starts out of Maharashtra, has grown and gotten bigger, and so that's the other thing that the English have to deal with. But um, the Maratha Empire, they start to break down on their own. They have this battle in 1761 called uh, the Third Battle of Panipat. I believe they were they were fighting against Muslims in the north. I think they were actually Afghan Muslims, and they lost that battle, and then they started to break down after that. And a little bit later, we have the Anglo-Maratha Wars. And this is, again, it's still not the official government of England. It is uh, this corporation using mostly Indian soldiers. Mm-hmm. So the first Anglo-Maratha War goes from 1775 to 1782. And... What starts this war is a succession struggle within the Maratha Empire. And the, uh, it will, well, yeah, within the Maratha Empire. And uh, the East India Company supports uh, one guy against the other in exchange for some concessions. And then the second Anglo Maratha War help, happens uh, in 1803, runs from 1803 to 1805. And the East India Company supports a provincial ruler in uh, this area called Baroda, which today corresponds roughly to the Gujarat state. And they help this guy um, break free of the Maratha Empire, which is a loss of territory and resources for them. So they lose most of the Gujarat uh, region. And then uh, the third Anglo-Maratha War goes from, sorry, 1817 to 1818, 
And that's where like the Maratha Empire has already been severely weakened and whittled down. And they just straight fight against the company, but then they lose. And uh, the East India Company takes pretty much everything away from them, except for some small places, like some small holdouts. <clears throat> so basically what they do, if you notice, is when two different groups are fighting, they pick the weaker group you know, to kind of support them against the stronger group. And then that weaker group wins when they owe them the favor. And they're mostly using Indian soldiers and they're funded by consumers. So it's not like what we would think of as a traditional military invasion. Um, and then the next thing that happens is the revolt of 1857 which is also called the Sepoy Mutiny, and it's also called the Indian Mutiny. And this uh, ends up being like the end for, the, for both India and for the East India Company. So um, what happens, there's, there's a few reasons. Basically, they're half of the army that's working for the East India Company decides to rebel. They decide, we, don't, we, we want independence. We don't want to be ruled by these English people anymore. So their reasons are a mixture some are legitimate, some are not so good. But uh, one thing is that the East India Company has been grabbing land and they've been taking it from both the nobility and from the common people, the peasants. So they, were, they had this thing called the Doctrine of Lapse. And what that mean, meant is that uh, if a nobleman dies and he doesn't have any biological son to rule, then his kingdom automatically goes to the East India Company. So they just take it over if he doesn't have a male heir. And, you know, they used to adopt heirs when this happened, but the doctrine of lapse doesn't allow them to do that. Okay, and then also peasants and farmers are having to pay heavy taxes at this point. And if they fail to pay the taxes or, they're, or they can't uh, make their loan payments, then East India Company takes their land. So basically, they own nothing and be happy, that kind of thing. <laughs> it's kind of it's like kind what of China, China is doing is in, uh, in uh, what other parts of the world right now. Yeah, a lot of the awful things that are happening now have happened before. I mean, you, you can't trust government or corporations. You have to keep your eyes on both. You shouldn't think that like one's a good guy and the other's a bad guy. <clears throat> in fact, they're both bad guys, but or or they have the potential to be bad guys, I should say. But then the, then the other thing that happens is, um, you know, they do have their in their army, the East India Company army, they pay uh, the English soldiers more than Indian soldiers. Not, not just talking about the officers, but guys that are the same rank, like grunts, because not all of the regular privates were Indians. Most of them were, but they're also people from England, too, which I guess maybe a poor person in England might be willing to sign up as a soldier in India, you know, but um, uh, so there's that. It's unfair, right, for doing the same amount of work, getting paid less money. Um, and then the English and this and this reason here is I don't consider this to be a legitimate grievance, but um, the English banned the practice of sati. Have you heard of that? No. Nope. So it used to be a um, a Hindu custom. And I don't know that everybody necessarily did this, but basically um, if like a woman became a widow, like if her husband died, she was supposed to kill herself. And the way that she would kill herself is by jumping on top of his funeral pyre and burning to death. So the English, they thought this was terribly barbaric and they decided to put a stop to it. And the, actually, um, if the woman doesn't want to burn herself to death, then she can live in like a home but uh, for widows, but they're required to uh, shave their heads and not remarry and live as beggars, basically. Um, and of course, this is one lasting legacy of the English being there is that uh, sati has, for the most part, fallen out of practice. But there wasn't a lot of uh, compassion for widows before then. And... Um, their chances of remarriage were pretty low. So uh, that's one thing the English did that was good, but it offended uh, the people there. And I, I also, don't know if that, that was good necessarily. I don't know if I agree. 
What, stopping Sati? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, statistically, uh, you're not likely to outlive your wife. You don't want you know, your wife to have to go through all kinds of garbage. You know, like people should have compassion on widows, I think. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I agree with that, but uh, uh, to you, no, I'm <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, on the other hand, it was kind of interfering with their freedom of religion to some extent. I guess uh, it's kind of a, it's kind of a a gray area. But I don't know. I think I don't know. Anyways, we talked about that a little bit if, in the. If Robert. the woman wants to do it herself, that's uh, you know, as an independent and strong woman. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know what? Germanic yeah. cultures used to do that too, right? The Vikings, uh, when they when the man would die, the woman would jump onto his burning uh, pyre as well. So that also happened in Europe too, to some extent. Um, so then uh, the the next I, the I, last. I, hmm? Go ahead. Sorry. Okay, sorry. There's one more. I, I heard. I think I remember one rumor that was spread that uh, um, the cost descent was. I think they told the, the Muslim soldiers that the cartridges uh, in which the ammunition was, um, that they were made uh, using pork fat. And I think you had to bite them open for whatever type of gun they had. And uh, the, the rumor was spread amongst the Hindus that it was made with cow fat. Yes, that was actually the, the last grievance okay. that I was going to mention. It's a, <laughs> that's the triggering thing. They told them, they, the English uh, introduced this new rifle called the infield rifle, which had special cartridge. And it was actually something that was uh, better and it was more efficient and easier to load. But they told them there's some rumor that got started that said like the, the cartridges were greased with pig fat or cow fat, both. So yeah. obviously, you know... So they basically, it was be. fake news. It was uh, fake news. <laughs> it was fake news, though, yeah. yeah. But that, that's what ultimately triggered them, and then half the army just straight up revolts. And uh, at this point, uh, so, so what they did is they, you, they defeated them, and then they used this as an opportunity to do away with the last Mughal puppet ruler. And that guy's name was Emperor Bahadur Shah Zafar. And they arrested him and charged him with treason and exiled him to Burma. So that was the end of that puppet government. And um, let's see, do I have an end date for the Maratha? Uh, yeah, that's, the, that's 1818. Okay, so they do away with like all of the final uh, Indian governments. I mean, if you consider the Mughals to be Indians, they were proud of being foreigners and not being culturally connected to the to the country. But um, yeah, after this, uh, the English government officially takes over. They say, you know, this is just going to be part of Her Majesty's realm, and they dissolve the East India Company. And uh, Queen Victoria is the first English monarch to be called the Empress of India. And I believe, like uh, the mm, the remaining forces that belong to the East India Company, the corporate soldiers, they're all absorbed into the English army. And now the English are officially like ruling this place. And they, they, you know, they didn't have to take it over with force. They, the corporation took it over and then they dissolved the corporation. They nationalized it, I guess you could say. But actually they, um, I believe they refunded the shareholders in the East India Co Company. And after this, India is a territory of the crown. Up until after World War II, when uh, the English can't really hold on to them anymore, you know, because they're so damaged by fighting with the Germans, yeah. they let them go. Uh, and most of their other overseas holdings, they lose at that time. But and a fun fact I found out is uh, there's actually a new, another guy who has... Uh, his name is Sanjeev Mehta. He comes from Mumbai. And he actually bought the rights to uh, the East India Company, I guess, from the English government. Like he purchased their logo, their logo and their um, their intellectual property rights and the title. And he's restarted it back up and opened a store in London. And I guess he's also he opened a store in India. They have a website. So I I uh, I'll put a link to that in there. 
Oh, that's pretty cool. I want to check him out. See what yeah. he uh, see what he's selling. Yeah, you could probably visit it, um, but I, I don't think he has the original. I'm pretty sure he doesn't have the original corporate office. Um, but I found pictures of that too, so I'll put that there. But yeah, it's interesting. You know, uh, one thing is that um, a lot of Indians were ready to collaborate with the English. There's uh, um, and, and not just high, you know, ruling class people, but regular people and merchants. And I think, uh, and, and it was all done with money, you know, because that's one thing that everybody likes is money. So they, so they got them and they, they got them by way of money, basically. Yeah. So, I mean, England yeah. was very rich, right? And, and very well connected. So I think it probably would, there were benefits to India as well to be part of the, the great British trade network that spanned all across the, the world. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, because they, they were also buying stuff too, um, you know, from the English network and that was one of the things that appealed to the um, the Mughals when they first started letting the East India Company set up shop is that they were going to buy goods from Europe that they couldn't get. I think one of the things they were interested in was iron. Um, but also, like, another, another uh, long-standing effect of this is the Anglo-Indian community gets started. Because while the, while the English were over there, um, a lot of the guys married Indians. And they, their kids, um, you know, ended up speaking English. So now you have another uh, ethnic minority in England called Anglo-Indians. And a lot of them will have like uh, European style names, first and last names. And they also will speak English for their, um, their first language. And they don't uh, wear like traditional Indian style clothing when they get married. I mean, they don't really... For the most part, they don't really look any different than um, regular Indians, but they kind of uh, they're they're another ethnic community because you have lots of different communities over there with different languages. So now there's just now there's one more. And they learned how to play cricket. Yeah, they learn <laughs> they learn how to play cricket, and the English also set up the the network of trains, which they still use today rather heavily. But um, what I heard is that uh, this was not done with uh, good intent. It was done so that they could loot the country more quickly. Uh, I don't know. Like, yeah, or, or move around armies, yeah. probably. Since... Probably the motive was to move their army around within the country and to move freight. I know that was a big uh, motive in Europe also for, uh, to build and uh, yeah, first train lines and later highways. Like, you know, like Hitler's autobombs, for example, because, uh, you know, like he's often like it was one of the few things people were like, oh, that, that was actually good. <laughs> but the reason those were built was uh, so that he could move his armies around more quickly. So and that's why our highways were built in the United States is so they could move military and their equipment quickly across from coast to coast. Yeah. 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 It's a lot of those things. Are, and um yeah, I mean, maybe do another video on, on this again, like talking about what the English did while they were over there. Because that's after um, the crown took over, things were different. And uh, the East India Company, at least, the, they were still nominally in charge. But um, with the English being in charge, that wasn't the case. And uh, sorry, the English crown, the government. And uh, that's also like one thing that I know that the English did that was bad was they took apart uh, some of the mo <clears throat> bricks from the Mohenjo-Daro sites, kind of spoiling those sites. And I don't know if they knew um, that those were ancient sites or I think if they did, they probably would have stopped because I know the English were interested in archaeology. I don't know. I'm just guessing. Because they were interested in, uh, like, when they colonized the place, they were also interested in the uh, artifacts. You know, they sent explorers and stuff there to dig into those things. Yeah, for sure. They were gathering lots of artifacts in uh, in London. <laughs> yeah, taking them Yeah, um, Well, I mean, it's because the archaeology was big, and uh, there was a really strong interest in uh, 
well, in Egypt, for example, um, like the Rosetta Stone was discovered by uh, by Napoleon and his armies in Egypt. Uh, but then after the English took over, they brought the Rosetta Stone over to London as well in order to crack the code. So, yeah. Huh. But yeah, cool, uh, cool, and interesting story. I think it's not that different from how the Dutch took over Indonesia, um, mostly through trade as well. And yeah, so it's it's interesting to hear like how does how did they? I, I always assumed it was just because the English were technologically superior, but then again, the Industrial Revolution didn't happen until like the 1760s. And they were technologically and, superior, but I no. don't think it was by... Yeah, but like by 1760, they'd already been there for over 150 years. So that, that wasn't it. So, and it wasn't like brilliant military strategies either. So it was just uh, slow weasel and tactics. steady. Yeah, yeah, interesting. They're weasel tactics. That's why, you know, I say to people, you got to watch who owns the land because whoever owns land is the one that's in control. And uh, they can really force whatever they want on you once they have the ability to make you homeless. And it could yeah. be, a, and this was all, this was like the literal corporate takeover of the government. And I guess, I guess like uh, most Indians, they didn't see the bigger picture. They're just like, oh, cool. These, uh, these English uh, businessmen are going to help me overthrow this guy that I hate, and then I can sit on the throne, and I'll let him set up a factory over here, and it'll generate more tax revenue for me. But then, well, of course... Why, that's why you need, like, a, a bigger idea to uh, to unite people, because otherwise, if you're only thinking about your own benefit, then it's easy to corrupt uh, individuals, because you're just, oh, you know, like, well, yeah, I'll just profit from this deal and uh, take advantage of it, and... Whatever, you know, I don't think about the other, the next guy. But if you have a bigger idea behind it, like, for example, your religion or, your, you, you know, like you have an idea about your nation, um, your country, you wouldn't be able to do that as easily. Um, maybe people will call you a traitor uh, or, you know, or maybe you just believe in it yourself. And that's why you don't do it. But yeah, if you if you if you take that away or that that sort of identity doesn't exist, like it didn't, I guess it didn't exist in India across India anyway. Yeah. Then you become easy uh, easy pickings, which so. is what they were. The um and they had no reason to like the Mughals or be loyal to them, you know, because the English actually gave the allowed. I shouldn't say gave. They allowed them more more freedom than the Mughals did. And uh, then there was the Maratha Empire, which kind of was fueled by religion. Like it was a Hindu, uh, a Hindu movement. Like they're kind of like an anti. It started kind of like an anti-Muslim crusade against uh, Aurangzeb. And I'll, I'll come to that in another video because it's worth talking about. Um, but yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. So that's all that I had, uh, unless you want to add anything. No, I mean, if you can include some pictures of like uh, skirmishes and like battle equipment they had, um, I would appreciate that. That's always cool because they did yeah. have some all armed uh, altercations. So, um, yeah, and maybe some maps across like time, like how uh, how they spread across time to see. Uh, I would love to see more of that, like how, you know, how they spread out their territory across the map. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I've got I've got a lot of that out already. I'll get some more, you know, by the time we post. And the things that I uh, that I mentioned that I wasn't quite sure of, I always put that stuff. Not always, but it, usually I put the that stuff in the notes. So if you're watching this video and uh, I say I'm not sure about something, then you'll see it, like uh, something in the in the slideshow pop up, you know, to kind of. Like there was a difference in equipment between the English and you know and the Nawab of Bengal. The English were a bit more advanced. I know the Nawab's people were used, still using matchlock rifles, but I don't know how much more advanced they are. And of course, at this period of history, throughout most of the world, nobody had any concept of camouflage. So everybody's going to be wearing like bright colors and regular clothes, and there's not much in the way of protective armor either. Yeah. So. I don't think, and, and, but during the 1700s and 1800s, there was no protection at all for the soldiers. 
no but it was is... it was battle tactics like uh, you know even like uh, napoleon's army didn't have any uh, camouflage either but uh you could still use brilliant tactics and uh o obliterate your enemy yeah so it's, it was... it's kind of a phase of history where um protection is not keeping pace with uh, weapons technology because because uh, when guns first came out the soldiers would still wear armor for the most part because you'd fire a few shots and that would be it and then you had to go to melee combat so it was still practical to wear armor but at this you know by the time you get in the 1700s and 1800s it's not practical to wear armor because the guns can uh, fire more shots of course if they're using a matchlock rifle then I don't think that's the case because um, that's like a string that you have to light. So, but I, but uh, yeah, uh, I'll find out something about the weapons uh, and and mention it there and show pictures. Um, yeah, I wonder if uh, Arma would be able to stop like a bullet like that, one of those old rifles, where I think they're just shooting little balls of lead, right? Yeah, think... no, the armor was not sufficient to stop the. Uh, the musket balls and armor doesn't really come back into use until World War One, or maybe a little bit before World War One. But in the in the twentieth century, like especially during World War One, they bring back helmets because of and the, those helmets wouldn't really stop a bullet, but they were brought back because of shrapnel because of the bombs going off. Yeah. And and now the kind of like the age that we're in, the soldiers do wear armor. Um, and it does stop a lot of the bullets, but it's also a load for them to carry. And uh, there's new, uh, you know, new refinements being done on the weapons, and the soldiers have to carry a lot of gear on top of that, which is stressful on their joints and limits how far they can travel. So there's a balance that has to be struck between protection and maneuverability. But actually, um, there's some development going on about like a hydraulic. Or, or like a robotic uh, exoskeleton that will go on over the soldier and it will make it so they can carry like a bunch more and the exoskeleton will bear the load rather than the, the soldier. So we're actually unironically going towards something that looks kind of like an Iron Man suit. Yeah, which is pretty cool. Yeah. I wonder if uh, what you mentioned about the camouflage, right? That's something that comes up a lot. I wonder, like you, you mentioned that there's a balance you have to strike between how heavy the armor is and um, your mobility. Like you want to be able to protect your soldiers, but they have to stay mobile as well. I wonder about the, uh, the camouflage uh, because it was so much about battle tactics back in the day uh, that you, as a commander in the field, you had to be able to see where your troops were. Um, you know, you had to be able to like identify where they were in the battlefield and maybe that was a reason because they didn't have modern um communication techniques either they were like, using flags to communicate with different uh brigades and regiments um so you need to be able to see where they are and how they're doing so maybe they were also that was a reason they didn't do camouflage because you wouldn't be able to see where your own troops were they wouldn't be able wouldn't be able to radio in like oh you know we're in position X Y Z or something so anyway. yeah you also don't want to have friendly fire either you don't want to get your troops mixed up with the others and during the 1800s and 1700s they wore those really loud and distinctive costumes so it's pretty obvious who to shoot at but actually if you think about it in the ancient world and in medieval times they still wore uniforms in, in addition to the armor and they had their colors and their emblems. So um, I think that idea has been around for a long time of knowing who's who. And like actually um, during the American Civil War, there was a Confederate regiment that was, um, and that was out west and it was like an all Native American unit. They were Cherokees. I think our Cherokees, Creeks, like mostly that. And uh, they, the Confederates, you know, they had supply issues from the beginning, so they couldn't give these guys uniforms. And as the war progressed, they couldn't uh, even resupply them with ammunition. So what they did is they, as they killed the Union soldiers, they just looted all, they, they looted their stuff. Um, and sometimes they stripped the bodies completely. And then these guys, 
they were they were going around uh, wearing union uniforms sometimes fighting against the union and it confused the uh, the union soldiers pretty badly when that was going on. Yeah, I can so imagine. Like a huge yeah. breach of of uh, protocol and normal behavior. But actually that that unit that Confederate unit was the last one to surrender and it was the only one to surrender with like a conditional surrender. Like the guy um, his name was Stan Wadey. He wanted to the government, the U.S. government, to guarantee they wouldn't take his land this time. So they said, "Okay, sure." But then, once everything was over with, they took his land anyways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why you keep your guns. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Yeah. Well, cool story. It's I appreciate uh, learning a bit more about India. It's uh, it's a big place, and yeah, with tasty it's, food. Yeah, it's, but it's not typically something we focus on a lot over here. I guess it depends on where you live, right? So um, it's, it's interesting to learn more. I'm sure, for sure probably British people w would know a lot about India and, and this this history. Um, but yeah, I, I don't. So I heard hear a lot about. of Indians went back with them when they left. Like uh, they liked being with the English so much that some of them, not not most obviously, but like a small number. They were so accustomed to English rule that they didn't want to stay in India, and they went back um, with the English. Yeah. But of course, there's still, like, um, there's a lot more Indians now living in England and also holding uh, positions of power in their government. And uh, it's kind of interesting, you know, because now um, a lot of Indians are moving out and setting up their own communities in other countries. Um, they call the uh, they call themselves Desi, which is like a term for the Indian diaspora all over the world. So, but yeah, it's interesting, man. We'll have to see. Uh, I just what, got an idea for another video. I'm gonna write it down. I won't mention it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it has moment. to be your surprise. Yeah, okay. The best kind of prize is a surprise. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on what the surprise is. All right. Something yeah. Like a landmine wouldn't be a good surprise. <laughs> yeah. Good surprise. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, man. I uh, thanks for uh, for this story. Um, if if you're listening to this, uh, appreciate you. Um, please uh, like and subscribe to our videos. Uh, share it with somebody that uh, that likes history as well. Uh, you know, we're just doing this for fun. And uh, this one was uh, recommended by Ivor's wife, but we also take recommendations from our listeners. So uh, please let us know what you're interested in. It might take a while, but definitely we'll, we'll get around to doing your topic as well. Um, and other than that, I think, Ivor, it's probably time to close it off, right? Yeah, let's close it off. Um, if you're, if you don't see your request right away, we're taking everything at this point. We don't have that many requests, but if you don't see it right away, um, you know you should know that uh, videos are recorded like about three or four weeks sometimes before they're posted. So we do get around to things, but uh, because of the difference between when we record and when things get posted, it takes a while before it shows up. So all right, great. Thanks, everybody. Yep, that's it.